So what you've heard so far is uh, the report on research. Um, what is next on the agenda is a brief update on policy interactions that we uh, drive at uh, Linux Foundation Europe. Um, let's see. And now, of course, this will include our favorite topic, the Cyber Resilience Act. So if you're interested in that, then please stay. So. And uh, I, I promise to be relatively brief so that you don't have to wait for that cup of coffee for that long. Let me see. We've got 30 minutes for that, so. Okay, so this, this will be an update on the and some European policy topics that we're interacting with. And before I even dive into it, I would like to point to the back of the room and say thank you, Kieran and Open Forum Europe, for the coordination work that you're doing here. It's invaluable. Without you, we couldn't do this. OK, so first, we look at the Cyber Resilience Act. The, the first part of this presentation will be an overview. Uh, can I ask for a show of hands, who of you has read the whole Cyber Resilience Act and know exactly what's in it? Uh. <laughs> OK, a couple of people in the room. Um, I would like to first give an overview of what the Cyber Resilience Act actually is so that we all know what we're dealing with and then give an assessment of what we think it means. It's a horizontal regulation. Um, so one, a regulation that is uh, about the uh, functioning of the EU internal market. Essentially, it means you have to comply with this act um, to be able to, uh, to, to bring products in the European market. And it doesn't matter if your business is located in Europe. As long as you're offering something to European consumers, you have to comply with this act. It has three policy goals. Reduce the vulnerabilities in digital products. Ensure cybersecurity is made through the product's life cycle, maintained through the product's life cycle, and to enable users to make informed decisions when selecting and operating these devices. Um, there's some key provisions in this act that are important to know. Uh, so as I said first, everybody who places a digital product in the EU market will be responsible for the obligations about recording, reporting and compliance. Um, these responsibilities entail fixing discovered vulnerabilities, providing software updates, and auditing and certifying the products. Um, now, here comes the first part that is maybe a bit surprising. The responsibilities, the, the three listed in the bullets, are borne by those who develop the software, not necessarily by the downstream integrators. Um, that means upstream making a component available already is responsible under the Cyber, uh, Cyber Resilience Act to, for example, audit these products. Um, who is affected by that? The, there are three groups, essentially. Individual developers that develop open source in a non-commercial way are excluded. Um, this is, however, a blurry exclusion because it says, unless, as long as you only occasionally receive funding through donations, but as soon as you make a real income out of that, it's basically considered commercial activity. So if you are, for example, a sponsor developer who receives a regular monthly payment, that exclusion does not cover you anymore. It speaks explicitly of donations. Um, if you're a not-for-profit organization or foundation developing open source, you likely need to comply with the CRA um, because the description um, that the CRA con uh, contains how commerciality is defined basically does not include open source foundations. Um, and if you're a private company, you definitely have to do, uh, comply with the CRA. Um, another maybe important point is that the CRA does not distinguish between open source and closed source software. Um, it speaks of software, um, and the only mention of open source is this exclusion for non-commercial uh, open source development uh, for the purpose of research and development, basically, not to, not to hinder scientific research, um, so not market-oriented. Obligations in the CRA, they are um, staggered in, in three groups based on risk. They are non-critical products. The assumption is that 90% of all digital products um, are in this group of non-critical. Um, by the way, digital products means software and hardware. That's another distinction that the CRA does not make. So um, it speaks of digital products and includes 
software hardware and the combination of the two. Um, for non-critical products, the uh, expected procedure is self-assessment of compliance with the CRA. Um, so you can basically just self-declare. For low-risk critical products, um, for example, web browsers, um, you can either apply an existing standard or go for third-party assessment. Now, the problem with the existing standards is that they don't exist. Um, well, that's okay, because usually legislation like this comes with a standardization request to the European Standards Development Organizations. They're not known to be super knowledgeable about regulating the uh, software ecosystem. So, in any case, so these standards don't exist yet, so this means you probably have to go for third-party assessment. Um, and then we get to high-risk critical products, um, there you have mandatory third-party assessment, and currently, at least in the current draft, the list of high-risk critical products includes operating systems for servers, desktops and mobile devices, hypervisors, and container runtimes. This is clearly open-source critical software infrastructure. This is not something primarily released by industry. So, very clearly here, the obligations under the CRA target large-scale open source projects. How should vulnerabilities be handled? Uh, first, you need to provide a risk assessment. Um, you need to ensure that the product is delivered without any known exploitable vulnerabilities. So at the time of shipping, you cannot have any known exploitable vulnerabilities. I'm looking at Greg over there, who will say, I can never ship a Linux kernel because we know there are vulnerabilities in there that we cannot fix. Um, by you. <laughs> um, anyway, so this is, this is one of the quirks. Uh, we need to ship software, secure, uh, so digital products, secure by default, minimize data processing to limit the attack surfaces, and we need to update, uh, provide security updates along the life cycle of the product. Many of these things we would clearly support if the implementation is done the right way. Uh, vulnerability handling, if you find a vulnerability, you need to fix it without delay. Um, perform regular updates and security reviews, disclose exploited vulnerabilities, and provide vulnerability patches to users. Now, um, keep in mind that all sounds great if you're a business, but as I said already, this can be the responsibility of an upstream foundation releasing a container runtime. Yeah, I and mean, even for a business, it's vague. But um, I, I, this is also vague because I'm just giving you an excerpt of it. There's lots of text that explains it, uh, and that's not on the slide. And vulnerability reporting, actively uh, exploited vulnerabilities need to be reported to the European Union Agency for Cybersecurity within 24 hours. Um, so, <laughs> one day. Uh, you have documentation obligations, um, a description of the design, development, and vulnerability handling process, an assessment of cybersecurity risk, risks. Um, you need to say which harmonized EU cybersecurity standards the product meets. Mind you, they don't exist yet, but that will come. Um, and a signed declaration of conformity that these things have been met, and a software bill of materials documenting vulnerabilities and components in the product. Uh, last bullet is a bit unclear, as it's required for part of the products, but not for all. But let's expect that long-term, three months, three years from now, um, software bills of material will be required. So everything I gave you so far, besides my snarky undertone, um, was just a summary of what is written in the text. I would now like to give a brief assessment um, with, to, to try to explain why you were worried about this, if it's not clear yet. Um, there are many concerns from all sorts of stakeholders. Um, there is this exclusion of non-commercial open source development from coverage in the CRA. And I think if, if there's one topic that we've spent hours of group discussions on how to improve this wording, it's that. Um, there are product lifecycle requirements. Um, since they don't distinguish between open source and proprietary software, um, there could be a requirement that if we make a stable software release that we have to maintain this for, I think the assumed period is five years. Now the open source development model is more we make the next stable version and that automatically deprecates the previous one. So we wouldn't maintain the old version for five years if we have a better new software. Um, record keeping requirements might be difficult for open source community, communities and the vulnerability disclosure requirements, they throw up a lot of worries. For example, what if we need to disclose something before a fix is ready? Or what if that disclosure co comes into the wrong hands 
and therefore can be exploited, the security vulnerability can be exploited even wider, and we can't fix it. Um, but yeah, in the end, for me personally, the key problem with this here is it does, it's not, does not distinguish between software development for open source and, and contributing to upstream and bringing a product into the market commercially along a normal supply chain. If you want to get more details on this, it's in this long blog post that I wrote last week. Um, but that is really the key issue because, because of this deviation from well-established norms, it can be that upstream open source communities are now responsible for security vulnerabilities introduced by commercial product projects downstream, which is weird. Um, there are two essential misconceptions in the CRA that we were not able to clarify with policy and lawmakers, um, even though we tried to explain it. One is, there's an assumption that the developers who know best about the software and its vulnerabilities and how to fix it are in the projects. And we tried to explain that upstream means that people contribute there, but that the developers are sitting downstream somewhere at the, all these commercial companies building products. They fix things as they build products and contribute them back upstream, but that doesn't mean that upstream has developers. Um, yeah, um, and the other we, misunderstanding I would say is that open source foundations are really large, well-funded fronts for big tech. Um, that might in, in cases, in individual cases, be true, but um, I gave this example of the Linux Foundation. If you divide the budget of the Linux Foundation, which is admittedly not small, by the number of projects we have, we can pay for not even two FTE per project. So certainly we cannot pay for security staff doing regular code reviews and security reviews on all the projects. Um, so we are suggesting that besides the well-developed uh, amendment proposals that the group organized by Open Forum Europe has developed with us, um, we are just suggesting that two things should happen with the CRA to make it work. One is that the responsibilities and obligations that it imposes must clearly be aligned with the structure of the supply chain. So, which means anybody who brings a product into the market is responsible for that product's attributes, not for less, but also not for more. Um, and you cannot point to upstream and say, I consumed insecure upstream software, it's their problem if you introduce a product into the market. That's the first demand. Um, and the second one is that the commercial entity placing the product in the market must bear all the corresponding responsibilities. Um, however, these are demands. They're heard in Brussels, but they're not yet. They haven't led to changes in the text. Where does it currently stand? This is with the red arrow points to the trilogues. This is the, the next step. So trilogues mean the, the European Commission, the Parliament, and the uh, European Council, the member state representation, are getting together and are hashing out the next version of the text in a three-way discussion. And uh, we have briefed all three groups intensively, um, repeatedly, and in detail. <laughs> <laughs> and we hope for good results. So, and, and, and by the way, the trilogues are supposed to begin late this month or early next month, and then it goes to a plenary vote if there's a successful outcome of that. Um, what do we at LF Europe do? Um, we continue in this ongoing collaboration with the CRA task force that Open Forum Europe coordinates. Uh, again, I can express how grateful I am for that, for that work. <laughs> um, we have a call to action on our Linux Foundation Europe webpage. This has been updated last week, so if you read it three months ago, you can now reread it again. Um, there are two blog posts linked on it. That one explains what does the CRA contain in detail that, that uh, open source developers need to know. And the other one is my analysis of the potential policy implications. Um, we will continue submitting our opinions, offering our advice to the trilogue phase. Um, and on Thursday this week, as part of the Open Source Leadership Summit, there will be a panel, a panel discussion on the CRA, where we, are, we have representatives from the kernel community, from, from somebody who provides a development platform, GitHub, and others to, to say how this was affecting. Um, question. Uh, 
Uh, I can't elaborate on that much. Uh, Kieran could maybe do it more. But um, essentially for me, what I know is that the trilogues result in a new version of the text that all three branches do agree on. And, and that will be submitted to a plenary vote. And when this happens, I don't know. And how the process happens, I actually also can't say. Yeah, so, but maybe in the break, you can ask Kieran. He's back there. He knows a lot about this. Um, OK. If there are any questions, I suggest there's a coffee break coming up after this. Um, we can meet in the hallway and, and discuss there. I would like to give a very brief rundown of, of the EU AI Act, um, which is the other one that is raising uh, a lot of interest. Um, the AI Act is a proposal for the regulation um, of harmonized rules on artificial intelligence. Um, the idea here is that AI systems, again, available in the European market, are safe and um, safe to use by, by consumers and uh, respect European law. Um, it also aims to facilitate investment in innovation in AI, uh, however, with strong governmental oversight. And this is a bit of a, a, a tightrope walk, because you're trying to, to make the innovation processes roam freely, while at the same time protecting the consumers from potential harm. Um, the AI Act applies a risk-based approach based on application. So it doesn't look at, or doesn't say what the technology looks like. It says, what is, what is it going to be used for? And it begins with low and minimal risk. There are no obligations if you, if you run an AI system that has no way of harming anybody or violating human rights. Uh, limited risks has transparency, brings transparency obligations. That means you need to disclose details about how, uh, what data you collect, etc. An example would be a chatbot. Um, High-risk applications require an ex-ante, that means before it's made available, conformity assessment. Um, an example here would be systems for biometric identification of individuals. Um, so you see, the, the more like, potentially harmful the use gets, the stronger the obligations get. And then there's an interesting group of unacceptable risk. Um, the use of these systems will simply be restricted and not allowed. Um, examples, group systems that exploit vulnerable groups um, or systems that can be used to facilitate the violation of human rights, um, et cetera. So you find on this, the act is quite clear. And um, yeah, we will just simply not be able to offer this as a system in the market or to operate it. Enforcement here is done by the member states. Um, the EU will set up an, an oversight board, the Artificial Intelligence Board. Um, and for high-risk systems, the responsibility for compliance will be with the member states of the European Union. Um, and this may require access to the source code and the model data. So you may have to disclose this to the oversight board um, if you are in the high-risk group. Um, and this may actually result in, like, corrective measures may include fines, but also restrictions of use or the, the obligation to withdraw the system from the market. Yeah. So, what are the stakeholder concerns in this case? Um, one is that the definitions are too broad. So, somebody argued that the way the European Union describes what artificial intelligence is already is uh, covered by sorting algorithms. Um, some groups say there's regulatory overreach, like um, it's too broad. Uh, others, however, say that there is underreach and that it's not covering everything it should cover. So this is uh, a good political debate to have. So civil rights groups call for wider prohibition. And um, I think it's more business groups that say you're overreaching into areas that are not understood. Technical flaws, like emotion recognition, is not very well described. Um, and so on. So you see that there are plenty of uh, concerns. One is, again, similar to the CRA, that by referring to existing standards, you are actually delegating regulatory power to standards development organizations. Because it's difficult to argue against them if they promulgate the standard um, and people apply, uh, comply with them, that maybe that wasn't the right way to do it. And yeah, there's a clear lack of individual enforcement rights. So as citizens, it would be difficult for you to enforce. Um, legislative process here. Trilogue's also supposed to start in September. 
Um, there are, there's input from the council that would like to narrow the AI definition, but there's also a suggestion, and this worries many people in the open source community, that the act should also cover general purpose and foundational models. Now, general purpose models are models that are generally trained on, for example, image recognition, but don't yet have a specific purpose. And those are the typical playing grounds of research and development, academia, and open source. You, you develop something that is useful for potential class of use cases, but it's not market ready yet. And with this um, amendment recommended by the council, the AI Act would already cover such like systems that are still experimental or in development. Um, yeah, so that was my overview of the AI Act. We are before the trilogues. These are the responsible people. Um, I picked the two, CI and AI Act, to tell you that in the European Union, uh, we're developing strong regulation that will affect the tech sector, and because of the uh, because the European Union market represents one third of the global market, the assumption is that all this regulation will have a global effect, similar to GDPR a couple of years ago. Um, we talked about the CAA, we talked about the AI Act, there's the Product Liability Directive that will be updated, the Regulation on Standard Essential Patents, and there's the Data Act, and they all affect what we do. So that's to explain to you why I spend time in Brussels and um, we have to deal with policy making so much. Um, regarding the CAA, uh, we are starting tomorrow. Oh, you can actually get stickers, hopefully, when Susan is back from the printers. Um, they look like this. Uh, fix the COA. There's a Twitter hashtag. Um, and, and you can please, um, if you are an individual developer, this will create a tweet for you where you tag the European Parliament and say, please, fix this. If you're a business, you can use this one. There are some... Um, responses, and I really picked European industry responses here, not the open source community. Um, so, for example, Nana Labs says the COA could create a series of unintended adverse consequences to the security and stability of open source systems. Uh, VDA, the, the uh, German Automotive Association, and clearly a European industry association, not known to be primarily a source of uh, software source code developer. They are, but it's not their primary business. Um, yeah, and they say, interestingly, very clearly, that the cybersecurity obligations should apply to the companies that bring FOSS to market and use it commercially and not to the developers who make FOSS source code available free of charge. So, very much what we say is supported by European industry. Okay, I'll leave this here. Um, Q&A will be in the break over coffee. And thank you very much. Oh, and here is the link, the links to the blog posts. Thank you. Woo! <laughs>